Hi, my name is Alex Cornicelli. I'm an iron chef, I'm a chop judge, and I also love bread. One bread that I love in particular is a Parker House roll. This is a classic American bread. It was invented in the end of the 19th century, they say, in Boston, Massachusetts. My mom grew up outside Boston. First connection to the Parker House roll. This was the very first recipe I ever made in a professional kitchen. Now, I'd love to tell you that the rolls were golden brown and perfect. They weren't. But after practicing a couple of times, this became part of my own personal repertoire. Now to start, this is a yeast dough. So we're gonna start by blooming the yeast. You have these cute little packets of yeast you get in the supermarket, dry yeast. Think of this yeast as napping gently in its package, but ready to party if you give it the right kind of room to grow, right? So grab your yeast, one pack, which is two and a quarter teaspoons, and put it in a medium-sized bowl. Now you need to give that yeast what it needs to bloom and grow and become the backbone of this delicious roll. So you're gonna add half a cup of warm water. What does warm mean? In this case, for yeast to bloom and grow, you need it to be between 110 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So literally, measure yourself half a cup of water, put your thermometer in it, and get it between 110 and 120 degrees. If it's over 120, the yeast, it gets burned out, literally, because the water's too hot. Not hot enough, and it's not warm enough to get that yeast going. It's a finicky thing. This is at exactly 110. So now you wanna just pour that half a cup of water right over that yeast. And immediately, you say to yourself, oh my God, I smell the beginning of bread. It's kind of cool to make bread at home. You look really cool to your friends, you know what I mean? Give this just a tiny whisk, not much, just to kind of mix them a little bit. You can see it's already starting to froth and bubble. But now that you've woken the yeast up from its nap in that little packet, it's hungry. You know what yeast wants? It wants a snack. And in this case, half a cup of sugar is the perfect snack for yeast. Add the sugar. Just give it a tiny mix. Now set this aside for one minute, just to allow it to kind of foam, bubble up, and get acclimated. Okay, so in here you have your bowl with your two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast, your half a cup of warm water between 110 and 120 degrees, and half a cup of sugar that gives the yeast a little snack. That really gets the yeast going. You wanna feed that yeast to turn it into bread. To that, you're gonna add one cup of flour. Fill your cup measure by spooning the flour in, right? And let it be a little bit too much, right? Shake it a little bit to allow the flour to settle. Just take an edge, a knife, spatula, and level it off. It's important when you're baking to measure. You can play around with savory dishes, pinch of salt, splash of vinegar, but with bread, you gotta be on the money. Add that single cup of flour to that frothing yeast, sugar, warm water mixture. Give it just a little whisk. We're not really mixing that much, but just kind of integrating, right? And you can see it, it's already turning into what looks like bread dough, right? You can also smell it. You can smell that that yeast has woken up and it's ready to party. This is like your little bread starter. So you're gonna cover this and just set it aside in a warm area near the stove, near the radiator, somewhere in your kitchen where it's kind of warm and allow those ingredients to get to know each other better. Cover with plastic. Think of this like when you're on the couch and you're ready to take a nice nap. You're just covering this with a little comforter. While the yeast is proofing and growing and creating that spark plug for your bread, you're gonna build the rest of your dough. You're gonna take the mixer, 
You're making a dough, so you want to use the dough hook, even from the beginning. A paddle, more for cakes and cookie doughs and other types of batters. Dough, dough hook. Start by adding two cups of room temperature milk to the mixer. Notice one important thing. You have lots of different ways to measure things. This is a liquid measure, and this is a dry measure. You don't want to measure milk in here, and you don't want to measure flour in here. So having a little liquid measure that you can use for liquids is really helpful. If you have a pint container hanging around your kitchen, you know that that's an automatic two cup measure. So I add two cups of milk and 12 tablespoons, a stick and a half, of butter that's melted. Now the milk is room temperature and the melted butter is room temperature. A really important little thing that everything about this dough be of a similar temperature, right? If you put two grumpy people in a room, they're gonna grump out together. Two happy people, the same. You want them to be a similar temperature so they integrate well together. So now, put your hook in and just start mixing the butter and the milk together. So crack your eggs one by one into a bowl, check them out before you add them to the dough. That way, you don't ruin the dough if there's anything wrong with your eggs. So crack one egg. I'm just gonna add it right in. You have two eggs in this recipe and you wanna add them one by one. Give the dough hook a minute to just work that egg over before you add the second one. Now how to crack an egg? A lot of people crack it on the edge of their dish. I personally like to do a light tap on the counter and then just separate it. Add your second egg. And just let that mix. The outside of the bowl, should, it shouldn't feel hot or even warm, but also not super cold to the touch. Kind of room temp. All right, so you've gotten here, the milk, the melted butter, and the eggs just spinning around. It's time for you to add that flour. Remember that you already have one cup of flour in the yeast mixture. So now you're gonna measure yourself five and a half additional cups of flour. The same way. Spoon it in, give it a little shake, level off the top, tap the bottom to get all the flour out. You repeat that five times. Measure your flour first into one bowl in case you forget how many cups you have, right? If you start measuring and dumping them right in the dough and you forget, you'll have to start again. It's like a little security measure. So here you have five cups, and then here's a little half cup, five and a half. Turn the speed of the mixer down really low so you can just slowly start adding that flour. And now add two tablespoons of salt. Let that mix in. And then your yeast mixture that you started with that's been kind of hanging out by the stove, gotten nice and puffy and yeasty and bready. Mm. You can see now why you need the hook. Once you add that flour, it's starting to form that ball of dough. Add that yeast sugar mixture. You've got your dough that's mixing. The hook's doing its job, really working the dough. It's starting to form a ball. Stop for a second and just scrape down any excess flour 
that might be kind of hanging out on the fringe in the suburbs of this. We want to get this all integrated, right? Give that another spin. You want it to allow this to spin on a low speed on the mixer, two to three minutes until it starts to pull from the sides and form a little bit of a ball or an integrated dough. This looks good to me. If your dough's a little bit wet for whatever reason, add a little bit more flour and spin it another minute. I start in quarter cup increments. I sprinkle a quarter cup in, mix it and see if that does the job. Up to half a cup more of flour if you need it. But this dough looks pretty good. Look at that. Doesn't that already look like bread? And you did this. It's so easy, right? Definitely clean the hook off. Now, where are we going to let this dough rise? Because that's what we need to do now that it's all mixed together. Let it hang out in a hot place and proof, as they say, and double in volume. I like to use just a regular metal bowl, tablespoon of butter, grease the bottom with the butter and the sides. Now, why do this? I mean, the number one reason is taste, right? Anytime you're adding butter, you're probably enhancing the flavor of your dish. But in this case, you're starting out with a ball of dough that's gonna grow as it sits in the heat of your kitchen. So it's gonna pull and rise and grow. If the sides are greased, then the dough won't cling to the sides of your bowl and strain to proof and rise. It'll just rise and be all buttery and Parker Housey and beautiful. Take the mixer off and simply use a bench scraper or a large kitchen spatula and literally just scrape that ball of dough right out into the bowl. Look at that. It's about half the bowl, right? For now, anyway. That's when you allow the yeast to do the work for you at this point. It's all mixed in here, all the ingredients. Cover it with a towel. And just set this aside to grow. We're looking for about double the volume. Alex, why can't I use plastic wrap? Well, if you cover this with a tight layer of plastic wrap, it can't rise past the wrap. That's why we want to use some kind of kitchen towel that allows you room if it proofs even higher, right? It's like elastic waist pants. Set this aside. Again, in a warm spot, near your oven, near your stove, in the warmest part of your kitchen, and let it rise from one and a half to two hours. So while the dough is proofing and rising, we're gonna clean down our station and get ready for the next step. It's amazing what it does when you just let dough do time in your kitchen. Let's look at our dough. Remember where it was? Remember how your dough looked? Now look at what happened. Look what you made at home. Beautiful bread dough little bubbles, pockets of air. Now you're ready to roll it and form the rolls themselves. How to do that? Pretty easy. You're gonna flour a flat surface. When my mom would make bread when I was a kid, she would just sprinkle the flour on the countertop or anything flat and clean. You can do that. I like a little security measure. I don't like any clumps of flour or anything. So one thing you can do is put some flour in any kind of strainer or little sieve. And what you get is a nice even layer of flour on your countertop. No clumps, no lumps. Now you're going to turn out the dough. Literally, just go from the side. Use your fingers to just detach it. You don't even need to do much. Comes out on its own, right? and you're just turning the dough out onto the flat surface. Now you're thinking, I'm rolling dough. I need a rolling pin, I need this, I need six friends to help me. You really don't. Flour your hands lightly, that way everything's floured, and just press the dough. Turn it a little bit on the floured surface so you know it's not sticking. 
If you feel like you need a tiny bit more flour anywhere, put a touch more. Keep that nearby. Just press the dough out with your hands. You want to form a rectangle that's about 8 by 16 inches and a, between 1 and a half and 3 quarters of an inch in thickness. You can feel this. Can you feel that dough, how silky and soft it is? I mean, it doesn't hurt when you use butter and eggs and milk, right? Get a rectangle, again, about 8 by 16 inches. You can see no rolling pin, just flatten with your hands. Notice how you can make the edges and the sides by patting as the dough spreads and pushing that edge with your other hand. Kind of useful when you want to make shapes and edges, right? Now it's time to cut your rolls. The goal is to make 24 rolls with this piece of dough. So we're going to start by cutting 12 even strips. What you can do is make the little cuts in your dough first. That way you can measure out what 12 looks like and you know in advance. If you just start cutting, you may get six really thick ones and have to squeeze six others into the last bit of dough. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, 10, 11, 12. I like that. And now you're going to cut one just to see what that dough looks like, see how it feels, see how it looks. Now make your cut straight down the middle. 12 on here, 12 on here, 24. And now cut your dough into individual strips. Notice how I'm pressing down. Don't be afraid to take your knife and really press down a little bit to make sure you're cutting all the way through the dough and making these individual pieces. See that? So here we have 12 on top, 12 on the bottom. Dry pastry brush, just brush the, any excess flour off the rolls. Because now that you've rolled them, you don't need any more flour. Even brush the flour away from the edges. See that? Pull one apart. Look at this dough. Can't you just feel it? You're going to take a roll, one roll, separate it from the bunch. You're going to leave a, the little tail hanging down on the counter, and you're going to just loop this over. Give it a little squeeze. That's the bottom. That's the top. Now, a Parker house is also known as a pull-apart bread, meaning you bake them in a row, all stuck together, and then when they're cooked, you pull them apart. You're going to have three rows of eight rolls. So you want to repeat that. It's okay if the dough feels a little bit wet to the touch. Notice how we're folding it. I'm going to park that one right next to its buddy. Don't be afraid to pull a little bit the dough. It's okay. It's not fragile. Notice how when you fold it, the seam is on the underside so that the weight of the bread is actually also sealing that seam in place, right? Fold, fold. If you have any that really stick together, flour your knife. That's another great trick. So you can make a cut without sticking to the dough. Anything that you need, flour it so that it keeps the dough from sticking. Fold the seam over. Yeah. 
again, you're just making a row of rolls. This is a really satisfying recipe to make. Now you can make these rows of rolls and you can freeze them raw like this and bake them anytime you need them. So if you're making these rolls for a holiday dinner, you could make them a week in advance, freeze them, just pull them out of the freezer and bake them when you need them. Fold, fold, turn it over. Don't be afraid to kind of pack them tightly like sardines in a can. They like being really close to one another. You're gonna make 24 rolls and on the tray, you're gonna have three rows of eight rolls. This is such a satisfying recipe to make. And once you get through the first couple and you kind of get the hang of it and the feel for the dough, this is so satisfying. This is one of those great American recipes that you feel like, oh no, I can't make that. I can't make bread. And you know what? You can. And you definitely want to start with a bread like this. Just some yeast, milk, butter, eggs, flour, and a good attitude. So you have three rows of eight. Now we're going to cover it again. You made the dough, you proofed it, you formed the rolls. Now you're going to cover it, you're going to set it aside and let this proof again for 45 minutes to one hour and then you're going to bake them off and eat them all. Okay, so I'm going to clean up a little bit. I love to use a bench scraper or a spatula just to gather all that excess flour and dough off your counter for neatness. And we'll just wait for those rolls to proof up and get ready to bake. So your rolls have been proofing and rising for about 45 minutes or so. You want to preheat your oven to 375 degrees to bake the rolls. That's pretty high because we're looking for some browning and some really good brown taste from these rolls. Okay, so the big reveal, right? Here we are, the rolls. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready for what you made? Do you see how much they've grown? Look at the difference. The dough doubles in volume when you proof it. You're gonna put these in the oven and bake them at 375 degrees for 12 minutes. Then you're gonna carefully open the oven door, towel in your hand and rotate the tray halfway and bake them for another eight to 10 minutes or until they're all golden brown on top. You have cooked these rolls, 12 minutes on one side, we rotate the tray halfway and you got another eight to 10 minutes on the bake till they're golden brown. Now we're gonna pull them out. Wow. Look at that. Traditionally, just give them a little paint with the butter, a little bit of extra melted butter you see that butter falling in the crevices there in between each roll? Stop it. This is like right before you leave the house, right? You check the mirror, you just check your hair, you check your, your outfit one last time. You say to yourself, I look good. See the butter just gives it that nice sheen on top. When you make these, you're gonna see that bread just feels like a living, breathing thing. And then we're gonna eat it. Finish with a tiny sprinkle of coarse salt, just a little bit on each roll, down the length of each one. Move your fingers back and forth as you put the salt on. So the salt falls in little bits all over each roll, not just in one area, but on the whole roll. You could also decorate these with sugar or spices, but I think they're best the classic way. You just brush of butter and the coarse sea salt. Salt not only gives it flavor, but also that little bit of texture. Should we eat one? I think we have to. Mm. 
lift it up, and that's that pull apart moment I was talking about. These are really fresh out of the oven, piping hot. Wow. Golden brown on the outside, milky and buttery, fluffy. You can really do anything with this roll. You may have to make a double recipe your first time, because you may eat the whole tray first and then have nothing to serve. It's happened. Thanks for making this tray of rolls with me. If you make them and they're good, you're going to say, I'm on a roll. <laughs>